بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله إن الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده قد قال تبارك وتعالى في كلامه المجيد والفرقان الحميد بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا ونبينا وشفيعنا وحبيبنا وسندنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم من صلى علي صلاة واحدة صلى الله عليه بها عشرة كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العزيز الحكيم رب زدني علما رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي The second part to Hazrat Sayyid bin Zayd radiyallahu ta'ala an The ninth installment inshallah of our Ten Promised Jannah. The last installment we discussed as a Sayyid bin Zayd radiyallahu ta'ala an in terms of he being the product of his father's supplication that when he was in pursuit of the truth he made a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that oh Allah if you deprive me of knowing what is the truth then don't deprive my son and that is why it's mentioned that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam the wahi was revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at that junction upon the revelation the father he passed away on the way back and on the first instance of declaring the kalima la ilaha illallah in public we find that Sa'id bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala was the first to accept that invitation towards Islam and I mentioned last time that there are a few accounts and stories of the life of Sa'id bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala that really stand out uh, before we continue with the actual uh, life of Sa'id bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala and some of the accounts I came across Sa'id bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala is not prolific for relating a hadith he has some a hadith but he's not <laughs> prolific but one hadith that he relates, recorded by Imam Tirmizi rahimahullah in his Sunan, Imam Abu Dawud rahimahullah in his Sunan, Imam Muslim rahimahullah in his Sahih. It's very apt today. In fact, Ahlu Palestine, Ahlu Gaza, and all those that are in tribulation from the Muslim world today, they can take a lot of solace from this hadith that. Sayyid bin Zayd relates radiyallahu ta'ala an. In fact, all the Muslims that have been killed in Palestine from the first Nakhba until now are all a manifestation of this hadith. That Sayyid bin Zayd radiyallahu ta'ala an, who he relates that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam said, مَنْ قُتِلَ دُونَ مَالِهِ فَهُوَ شَهِيدٌ وَمَنْ قُتِلَ دُونَ دَمِهِ فَهُوَ شَهِيدٌ وَمَنْ قُتِلَ دُونَ دِينِهِ فَهُوَ شَهِيدٌ وَمَنْ قُتِلَ دُونَ أَهْلِهِ فَهُوَ شَهِيدٌ The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, he said, that whoever is killed in defense of his or her wealth, whoever is killed in defense of his or her life, Whoever is killed in defense of his or her deen, religion, and whoever is killed in defense of his or her family, فَهُوَ shaheed. They are martyrs in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they reach <coughs> the status of martyrdom in full. 
And so as I mentioned, this hadith that's recorded by Imam Muslim, rahimahullah, from the very first instance of the first Nakhba, this is exactly what has been playing out, that these people have lost their lives in defense of their family, in defense of their land, in defense of their wealth, in defense of their deen. Today they're only being killed because they proclaim the kalima shahada, la ilaha illallah. And in the defense of their own selves. All of these are applicable. So alhamdulillah, there is much solace for the people of Palestine that's conveyed to us by this hadith of Sa'id bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala. That it gives us a lot of uh, comfort in the sense that those that are being killed and slaughtered, the comfort isn't in them losing their life, but the comfort is in knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is accepting them with martyrdom, with shahada. And their ranks being from the shuhada is so high that it's unexplainable, unimaginable. So Sa'id bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala an, from his life, there are a few standout and not- noteworthy incidents that are mentioned in the books of Tariq. As I mentioned last time, and we discussed in the seerah of Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala an, that Sa'id bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala an was the nephew of Khattab who was the father of Umar radiallahu ta'ala an. And in terms of marriage, Sa'id bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala an was married to the sister of Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, an Fatima bint al-Khattab. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala an was married to the sister of Sa'id bin Zayd, Atiqa. And so there's a close bond there. Umar radiallahu ta'ala an accepted Islam approximately at the age of 26 or 27 years of age. He was 13 years after, in terms of birth, of Amul Fil, the year of the elephants, when the Prophet was born. Sa'id bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala an accepted Islam at a very young age. So first, number one, he was married quite young. And his acceptance of Islam took place at the age of 19. So at the age of 19, Sa'id bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala who accepted Islam. And so there was a gap of about seven or eight years between Sa'id bin Zayd and Umar radiallahu ta'ala. Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala who was quite not built, quite flimsy, quite skinny. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala who were quite aware of his demeanor. On one occasion, Umar radiallahu ta'ala who was stood in the Kaaba area and he overheard the Quraysh complaining about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And they were saying that this person is causing us a lot of grief, a lot of trouble, a lot of harm. And it would be better if he's not here. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala who said that I decided on that morning that I would, I would end this situation completely. I would go and I would kill Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then this problem would be solved. The Quraysh would be happy again. We'd be living our normal lives. So he says, I sat out in a hurry looking for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, on the way I met an individual by the name of Nu'aym ibn Abdullah. Nu'aym ibn Abdullah. And so when I met him, Nu'aym greeted me. He said, how are you, Umar? And I had known that Nu'aym had accepted Islam. So I was already angry with the Prophet Wasallam. So I told him that you don't talk to me. I have no reason to talk to you. So he said, what's, your, what's, what's the issue? So he says, I'm going to kill the person who proclaims the Shahada, who is deviating everybody from their original faith. So Naim said, listen, well, just leave it as it is. If you don't want to believe, you don't believe. You go about your way. Let things be. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala said, no. That's not going to happen. He has to stop. And because he's not stopping, I'm going to kill the Prophet ﷺ. So Naim said, I didn't want to cause any trouble, but I didn't want Umar ta'ala to end up harming the Prophet ﷺ. So for me, there were two options. Either leave Umar ta'ala and let him go to the Prophet ﷺ, which could have ended up in harm being caused to the Prophet ﷺ. Or I could have used the tactic, a strategy to, a strategy to divert his attention. And he says, the strategy I used is said that, Ya Umar, 
Why are you worried about the Prophet Why don't you sort your own household out first? So Umar said, what do you mean? My house. Khattab, his children, my uncles were all opposed to this. So Nu'im said, no, that's not true. There is your own brother-in-law, Saeed bin Zayd, and your own sister, Fatima, who have accepted Islam. So Umar said, what? My brother-in-law? My sister? So again, the objective wasn't to cause harm to Sayyid bin Zayd, but to not let harm reach Rasulullah So when Umar heard this, his attention quickly switched from the Prophet to Fatima, his sister, and Sayyid bin Zayd. And he rushed towards the house. And when he got to the door, he heard from inside a voice that he had never heard before, or he had a, a strange voice. That was Khabbab bin Arat radiallahu ta'ala, an early acceptor of Islam as well. So Khabbab radiallahu ta'ala was versed in whatever Quran was revealed until then. And he would secretly teach those who had accepted Islam. So he was in the house teaching Sayyid bin Zayd and Sayyid bin Zayd's wife Fatima radiallahu anha. So Khabbab burst onto the scene, banging on the outside of the house, Opened the door, who's inside? Khabab radiallahu anhu said, as soon as I heard his voice, I jumped. I hid away. I didn't want Umar radiallahu to catch me. And so Fatima and Saeed bin Zayd are left inside the house. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala who barges in, and he immediately, his demeanor was of a very hot character, extremely the temper until he accepted Islam. When he accepted Islam, one of the qualities that's mentioned of Umar radiallahu ta'ala, كَانَ وَقَّارًا عِنْدَ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ وَقَّافًا عِنْدَ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ That Umar radiallahu ta'ala, irrespective of the emotions that he was going through, كَانَ وَقَّافًا He would come to an abrupt halt in the kitab Allah, whenever the Quran, whatever was to do with the Qur'an. So if someone was upsetting him, he was upset, you would see in his face, you read a verse of the Qur'an and that's gone. But that changed after Islam. So he pounces on his brother Saeed bin Zayd, brother-in-law Saeed bin Zayd, and he begins to abuse him physically. So his sister Fatima comes to the defense of Saeed radiallahu ta'ala. And in doing so, Umar radiallahu ta'ala turns his attention towards his sister. So if Saeed bin Zayd was 19, his sister was younger. <coughs> Common practice in those days were to get married young. Yet despite the sister being younger, his anger was extreme and he began to hit, slap his sister until she was knocked over and she began to bleed from a wound. When this happened, Fatima realized that, that there's no point. It doesn't matter what we say at, because when he was asking, what were you doing? They were saying nothing. We were just speaking to one another. There's nothing. We're, and he's saying, you're lying. You were discussing the religion of Muhammad. And they're saying, no, there's no such thing. Who was the third person? We don't know what you're talking about. But when he was struck, when she, he struck her, she realized that Omar is not going to listen. It doesn't matter what excuse I give, what we say. He's going to carry on. So she said, you know what? The truth is that, yes, we've become Muslim. You do what you want. What's the most that you can do? The most that you can do is that you'd have to bury me in Saeed. That's the most. We don't stand a chance in defending ourselves against you. You are the warrior, Umar. So if you continue your attack upon us, the only one that's going to get harmed is us. But the most that can happen is that we die. But yes, we've accepted Islam, whether you like it or you don't. It's when that extreme situation came about from the sister that we're not going to change our view and we have accepted Islam and we're willing to take whatever punishment comes in relation to that, that Umar radiallahu's anger begins to subside. He starts to see beyond the red. He's able to use some logic. And so he says that, okay, fine, fine. He starts to calm down. Show me what you were reading. And there were scattered papers from Surah Taha in those days on parchment, on leather that the Prophet ﷺ used to have the Qur'an recorded. So he said, give me those parchments, I want to read them. So she said, you can't touch them. You're in a state of impurity. 
You have to make wudu, you have to come into a state of purity before you can touch them. He says, I won't destroy them, I want to read them. So, no, you can't. You have, to, you have to follow the rules that Allah and His Messenger have set down. Irrespective of who you are, that makes no difference. You can be the warrior, Umar, it makes no difference. So he agrees. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when he reads the passages of Surah Taha and the verses, the first few verses inside there, uh, as it is, Umar radiallahu ta'ala, and we're not discussing Umar radiallahu ta'ala, so I'm not going to carry on, but we know that he was somewhat intrigued by the Quran. We find in accounts that Umar radiallahu ta'ala, before he accepted Islam, used to hide behind the walls where the Prophet would perform tahajjud prayer and he would listen. And he would say, I hate what's being recited, but I'm pulled towards it. I don't believe in any of this, but there's something inside, this ta'thir inside that Quran that I can't explain. So he has a softening and he says to Sayyid bin Zayd, take me to Muhammad And so Umar radiallahu ta'ala was taken to Darul Arqam, where the Prophet was meeting with some companions. And they knock on the door and someone asks, who is he? He says, Umar. So the people inside, the hadith mentioned the people inside, say, yeah, don't open the door. <laughs> That's Umar outside. It's dangerous. We know he's looking to cause trouble. So Hamza radiallahu ta'ala an, the uncle of the Prophet was there. He said, open the door. Just like he has a sword, I have a sword as well. If he's come for good, he's welcome to the good. If he's come for evil, we'll show him as well. I'm not afraid. So Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu tells the Sahaba to open the door and the Prophet وسلم, allows Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu to enter. When he enters, this is the statement the Prophet وسلم makes. He said, Umar, it looks like the dua has been accepted on your behalf. And the shurra, the commentators, they mention what had happened is the night before the Prophet وسلم, had made a dua to Allah. The Ya Allah, Strengthen Iman, uh, strengthen Islam with either the acceptance of Islam by Abu Jahl or Umar ibn al-Khattab, whichever one there is more good in. So the Prophet made this dua, Ya Allah, we're finding it very difficult. There are two individuals whose Islam can benefit Islam tremendously. So either give hidayah to Abu Jahl, my uncle, or give Islam to Umar ibn al-Khattab. So the Prophet said, Ya Umar, it looks like Allah has accepted the dua in your behalf. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he accepts Islam. So in this account, we traditionally reflect on Umar radiallahu ta'ala. But in reality, the one who became the sabab, the means, plays an important part. And most of us don't even know the name. The Sayyid bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala an, he is the reason why Umar radiallahu ta'ala accepts Islam. Who does Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu turn out to become? What is his status in Islam? Something we've discussed already. The first individual to be titled Amirul Mu'mineen. The second Khalifa of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam statement, لو كان نبي بعدي لكان عمر. If there were to be a prophet after me, it would be Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu saying, that on many junctions, Allah revealed verses to statements that I said. This is Umar radiallahu Who gets the reward for everything that he did? Who gets the reward? Sayyid bin Zayd. Sayyid bin Zayd who guides this person or prompts this person towards good. Who explains that this is what Islam is. Fatima, the sister of Umar radiallahu who explains that this is what Islam is. And takes them to the Prophet ﷺ, becomes the means of their Islam. They're the ones that benefit tremendously from the deeds of Umar <coughs> And number two, Sayyid bin Zayd whose willingness to even forgo his life for Islam. He knew the consequence of going against Umar He felt the consequence. But said, doesn't matter what happens, it doesn't matter what Umar says. Islam is Islam. Haq is truth is the truth, irrespective of the consequences of it. So that's number one. 
Sayyid bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala becoming the reason or the means for the iman of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala. And a second incident that's traditionally mentioned in the books of Tariq. If you listen to any lecture about Sayyid bin Zayd, if you read any books on Sayyid bin Zayd, the small amounts that you'll find written, you'll find this particular incident. It's very apt. It's very, very important to understand this statement of uh, both what he says and the implications behind it. In the time of Sayyiduna Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala an, when he was the Amir al muminin or he was the leader of that time, I should say, the Khalifa, he had appointed governors throughout different places. And one of his governors was a name by Marwan ibn al-Hakam. Marwan ibn al-Hakam. So one, at this point, Sayyid bin Zayd was near his end in terms of life. He was elderly. So a woman by the name of Urwa bint Uwais. Urwa bint Uwais. She came to Marwan ibn al-Hakam and she says, I have a complaint. I have a complaint. And the complaint is against this illustrious Sahabi, Sa'id bin Zayd. So Marwan says, what's the complaint? So she says that Sa'id bin Zayd's land is next to my land. This riwayat is recorded by Imam Muslim, rahimahullah, Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah. it's an authentic hadith. His land is next to my land. And what he's done is he's taken a portion of my, that's in my boundary into his. He's taken something that belongs to me. So Marwan ibn al-Hakam said, this is a very, very serious allegation. Very serious allegation. And I'll explain why it's serious in a minute. So Marwan ibn al-Hakam, he calls on to Sa'id bin Zayd. And he says, you have to come to the mahkamah, to the court, and we need to discuss this. So Sayyid bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala says, fine, let's come. He comes to the mahkamah and he says, what's the accusation? What's the allegation? And so Marwan ibn al-Hakam says, this lady here, Urwa bin Uwais, she is claiming that you have taken a portion of her land. And Sayyid bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala's eyes pop up. Like, Allahu Akbar. Accusing me of something like this? Kaif. This is the words they use. Kaif. وَقَدْ سَمِعْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ وَسَلَّمَ يَقُولُ مَنْ أَخَذَ وَمَنْ ظَلَمَ شِبْرًا That whoever من الأرض شِبْرًا or شَيْئًا تُوِّقَهُ مِنْ سَبِعِ أَرْضِينَ He says, كيف? How can I take something, this land that doesn't belong to me, when I heard the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم saying, what did I hear? I heard the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, that whoever usurps, ghasb, takes unjustly land that doesn't belong to them, even a handspan, even a handspan, to wiqahu yawm al qiyamati min sabi'i ardeen. And there are two understandings of this that this person will have that land wrung around his neck seven times on the day of judgment. Meaning his neck will be, so one of the punishments on the day of judgment and the hereafter is physical. So we find that the inhabitants of Jahannam, their thin is very thick, extremely ghalif. And the reason for that is the punishment is able to affect it over and over and over and over and over again. And so similarly, the neck of this person will be extended to the point that this land that this person has usurped unjustly, it will be wrung around this person's neck seven times. Once Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha overhears Abu Salama. Abu Salama radiallahu ta'ala anhu quarreling with another individual about some land. So Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha listens in for a while. And then he sa she says, Ya Abu Salama, ijtani bil ard. Ya Abu Salama, اجتني بالأرض فإن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال من ظلم قيد الشبر من الأرض توقه من سبع أرضين أو أبو سلمة be very careful about land in fact stay away from it why I heard the messenger صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم saying 
that whoever takes unjustly even a hand span of land that doesn't belong to them, it will be wrung around their neck seven times on the day of judgment. And the riwayat of Tabrani, it's mentioned that من أخذ من الأرض شيئا بغير حقه خسف به يوم القيامة إلى سبع أرضين. That the second interpretation, I mentioned there's two understandings. The one is that it's wrung around the neck. This is the second understanding. That whoever takes land that doesn't belong to them, even a small amount, shibram min al-ard, that a hand span, this person will be buried seven times deep in that land on the day of judgment. So either it's wrung around this person's neck, or this person will be buried in it set by seven lengths of the, of the, of the amount of that, uh, that piece of land. And there are two things in this hadith. First, the uh, first subtlety that has to be understood is how the Sahaba considered and they took ilm. Ilm was not something that they just spoke. Listen to his statement. He said, how can I take this when I have heard the Prophet said, Meaning, it's not possible for me, say the saying, to have heard a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ and go against it. His objection wasn't on the fact that you're accusing me of something big. It's the fact that I have heard the Prophet ﷺ say this and you think I'm going to go against it. It's not possible. It reminds me of Imam Bukhari rahimahullah. Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi. He says towards the end of his life, he said, it's been 40 years that I've heard the hadith of Ghiba and I can swear by Allah after hearing that hadith once, I have never backbited about anybody in my life. So ilm was not, is not just something that's said, it's actually acted upon. And this is what bothered Sayyid bin Zayd. What bothered him is the fact that you accuse me of going against ilm of the Prophet That's number one. Number two is his response. His response. Now, generally we hear that there is the act of, in Islam, forgiving, the act of you know, overlooking. You'll find in the books of Hadith that this is absolutely the truth, that one should overlook if somebody does something wrong to them. But you'll also find in the Hadith that the Sahaba Kiram and Ridwan and Tajma'een were human. They were human. So Sayyid bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala an, when he's accused by Urwa bin Uwais, he says to Marwan, that land belongs to me, it doesn't belong to her, but she can have it. She can have it. I have heard the Prophet ﷺ with this threat towards someone who takes land that doesn't belong to him, she'll have to deal with it. Number one. Number two. Allahumma. He says, Marwan, I'm not talking to you anymore. I'm not talking to you. Allahumma in kanat kathiba. That, oh Allah, if this lady is lying, Fa'amiha, then make her go blind. Number one, make her go blind. Waj'al mawtaha fi ardiha. And this land that she craves so much, make her death be inside there as well. I want my innocence to be proven on this earth. So number one, Ya Allah, for her accusation against me, take away her eyesight. Make her go blind. And number two, Ya Allah, make her death be on this very land that she is accusing me about. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of the Prophet wasallam. He said in a hadith, Inna min ibadillah. Inna min ibadillah. Law aqsam la abarrahullah. That there are those servants of Allah that if they swear an oath on Allah, meaning if they make Allah their witness to something, Allah will make sure that that oath goes as, as they want it. There was once an individual by the name of Anas ibn Nadar. Anas, the son of Nadar. Anas' sister, Rubayya, she was with her slave girl and she struck the slave girl and a tooth fell out. The tooth fell out. 
And so the family of the slave girl came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, Rubayya bint Nadar has struck the slave girl and she has lost her tooth. We want Qisas. We want Qisas. So the options in Islam are eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, or forgiveness. He said, we don't want to forgive. So the Prophet summoned the brother Anas ibn al-Nadhar and said, look, the family has come to me and this is the rule. The rule is an eye for an eye. So Anas ibn al-Nadhar said, Ya Rasulullah, atuksar, will the tooth of Rubayya be, will it, will it be broken, Ya Rasulullah? Are you telling me that my sister's tooth is going to be broken? Wallahi, Wallahi, la tuqsar thaniyatu rubayya. I swear by, he takes an oath. I swear by Allah, the tooth of rubayya, Allah won't allow it to be broken. So the Prophet says, Ya Anas, Kitabullah al-Qisas. Anas, it's not between you and me. The Kitab Allah, the book of Allah says this is Qisas. So Anas says, he calms down, he realizes I'm speaking in front of the Prophet But he's made this statement. Wallahi la tuqsar thaniyyatu rubayya. So the Prophet says, this is the judgment and we will come back to this when it's time. The family goes away. Rubayya goes away. Anas goes away. The Prophet goes away. A few moments pass, a few days pass, and the family comes back to the Prophet ﷺ. And they say, Ya Rasulullah, we've deliberated, we've thought, you know what, we want to forgive. We want to forgive. And so the Prophet ﷺ makes a statement. Inna min ibadillah, man law aqsaba ala Allah la abarrah. There are those servants of Allah who are so near to Allah. Who are so close to Allah. Law aqsama ala Allah. Even if they swear an oath on Allah that Allah won't do this, Allah will listen to them. Allah will listen to them. And this Saeed bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala an was one of these individuals. Mustajabu al-Dawat. He raises his hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah listens. Allah listens. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam was in Makkah al-Mukarrama. One of the most difficult instances that happened with the Prophet ﷺ was on one occasion, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala an. <clears throat> he says, the Prophet ﷺ was in the Kaaba vicinity and he was performing salah and he went down into sajda. And there were some chieftains of Quraysh, Utayba, there was um, Abu, Abu Lahab, Abu Jahal, and so, out of mischief, they were laughing, prodding one another, and they said, you see that dead carcass there? There was a camel. Take out the intestines, put it in a sack, and put it on the back of the Prophet when he goes into sajda. <clears throat> when he goes into sajda, put those intestines on his back. Give him some trouble. So Abdullah ibn Masood, he says, he relates, I am seeing this, but I'm weak, I'm feeble, I can't do anything. So when the Prophet ﷺ goes into sajda, they put this, the intestines on the back of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ is unable to move. With Allah, let me, make a, let me make a little statement here. Especially in the context of what's happening around the world. With Allah, Allah's retribution doesn't have a timeline. But when Allah's retribution comes, it is extremely, extremely severe. So Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu ta'ala he says that someone rushes to Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. And Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha <coughs> comes rushing to the Kaaba. And she begins to push the intestines struggling off the back of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when his back is cleared, he stands up and he makes a statement. 
And he names the seven and then somebody wanted eight individuals that were sitting there. And he says, Ya Allah, you deal with these people. Ya Allah, I'm not going to say anything else now. You deal with these people that have troubled me. I leave it to you now. The battle of Badr comes, all seven of them are lying on the floor. All seven of them are lying on the floor. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam, when Surah Lahab was revealed, Surah Lahab was in relation to his uncle Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab comes home and he says to his two sons, Utbah and Utaybah, that in your nikah, you have the two daughters of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Umm Kulthum and Ruqayyah. Utbah was married to Ruqayyah, radiyallahu ta'ala anha. This person, Muhammad وسلم, has insulted me and he's saying his God is insulting me in the Quran as well. What are you going to do as sons? What are you going to do? So in one riwayat Utbah and the second riwayat Utaybah. One of them comes to the Prophet وسلم, and he says, your God or you have sworn at my father and he swears at the Prophet وسلم. And what the Prophet وسلم, ignores him. He swears more. And then he says that because of what you and your father, what your Lord has done to my father, I divorce your daughter. As a punishment. As a punishment, your daughter is divorced. Ruqayya. So the Prophet said, Allahumma sallit alayhi qalban min qilabik. Oh Allah, I appoint one of your animals of prey to deal with him. Allahumma sallit alayhi kalban min kilabik. So he was traveling, Utbah traveled to a place in Sham. And he was resting. And all of a sudden in the jungle forest area, they noticed a creature, a lion came out. And it begins to encircle. So Utbah says, this is Muhammad's God's punishment. So all the people, Utba and Abu Lahab, they were they had money, extreme amounts of wealth. So Abu Lahab used to say that if Muhammad is correct, it's okay. I will ransom myself with my money on the day of judgment. This was his arrogance. He would say that if Muhammad is correct in his message, and I have not accepted his message, and his God asked me on the day of judgment why I didn't accept, I will say to him, he used to say two things. These are my children, take them in ransom. This is my money, take it in ransom. So Allah, that's what Allah says. Ma aghna anhu maluhu wa ma kasab. His wealth is of no benefit to him on the day of judgment. So extremely powerful in the society. So he says to all the people around him, you guys surround me. Make a circle around me. So that I'm protected from this lion. But once that dua reaches... Once those in min ibadillah man law aksama ala Allah la abarra, once they make that supplication, it's too late. Understand that. That lion jumps over this circle of people, only attacks Utbah, grabs hold of him by his neck, jumps back over and is gone. You can find countless accounts of Sahaba Kiram Ridwanullah Tana Majma'een. Where well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger has warned us, Sayyid bin Zayd says that you are accusing me of something that you're lying about. You want this land? Take the land. However, you're not going to go scotch free. You can't make this accusation against me and expect no retaliation. But my retaliation will be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma in kanat kathibatan fa'amiha waj'al mawtaha fi ardiha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his answer comes. And again, this is very much in the context of what's happening today. Many Muslims struggle with this. That we make dua, we make dua, we know, we know who the oppressed are. But understand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's answer doesn't have a timeline that fits our understanding. As difficult as the scenes are, as difficult as the, uh, as the information that we're getting is, where 
we saw the viral video last week of a young boy on an IV drip being burnt alive in a, in a tent that's placed outside the hospital because they can't go inside the hospital. We've seen it. So as difficult as that is, if anybody still has a question of who the oppressed is, then what can you say? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's answer will come. And so in this hadith, the muhaddithun, they mentioned that Within a few months, this woman goes blind. But Sayyid bin Zayd didn't just want this. He wanted clarity. This accusation. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing was that there was a flood. And in that flood, when the water receded, receded sorry, there was a clear demarcation of the boundary. So Sayyid bin Zayd said to Marwan, come. Now you come with me. You come. And he takes Marwan and he takes the, the people who are responsible for the boundaries of the land and he takes them to this land and he says, now show me, was that not part of my land or not? Marwan ibn al-Hakam says, I apologize. I apologize. Within a few, de within a few days, this lady, Urwa bint Uwais, in her blind state, goes into this very land. She knocks herself into the well, falls into the well, and as the dua of Sayyid bin Zayd was made, she dies inside that well of hers. So in this hadith, this incident, where the Prophet has told us, be wary, there are some individuals that when they make dua to Allah, they're, they, are, they are extremely close to Allah. Be understanding of that. If they raise their hands, they don't do it. But when they do, then there are consequences. And the consequences are real. This woman lost her eyesight and lost her life because of the dua of Sayyid bin Zayd. How close was Sayyid bin Zayd to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How close? From the Ashara Mubashara, from the 10 promised Jannah, he is one of those individuals that we very rarely read about or hear about. Very rarely. But look at the life that we've discussed. He is the reason why Umar radiallahu ta'ala who accepts Islam. He is the first to say labbaik to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam calls people towards the general da'wah. At the age of 19, he's willing to give up everything for Allah and his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Age of 19. And when it comes to ilm, he is saying that it is not possible that I know a hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and I go against it. It is not possible. If I relate this hadith to you, understand that I will follow it to the T. And for someone to accuse me to go against this hadith in essence, then they have to suffer the consequences. So Sayyid bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala an, number nine in our list of the ten promised Jannah. Many lessons in his life, his young nature, despite being young, his willingness, he made hijrah very early. He made the hijrah, he performed and he participated in all the battles physically except for Badr. And I explain why not in Badr because the Prophet ﷺ had sent Sayyid bin Zayd and Talha ibn Ubaidullah to scout the caravans of the Quraysh. So though he wasn't there physically, when he came back, the Badr was complete. The Prophet ﷺ said, because you were tasked by me during Badr, you get the bounty as well. The booty that was the war booty that's distributed, Mali Ghanima, it was given to Sayyid bin Zayd even though he wasn't there. And after that occasion, he was present in every single battle of the Prophet There's one incident and I'll conclude, inshallah. In the battle of Yarmouk, in the battle of Yarmouk, after the Prophet passed away, he says, I was very frightened. The odds were stacked against us. And I felt the fear. And then he said, I came to one Sahabi. The Sahabi's name eludes me. And the Sahabi said to me, you know, when you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so the Sahabi had it in his mind that we're going to die. So he says, can you convey my salam to Allah and his messenger and say whatever you promised, we have found it to be true. And so Sayyid bin Zayd said, once he said this to me, all the fear was gone. And when I read this account, subhanAllah, I remember the people of Palestine. That's what they tell one another at the moment. That they tell him that if we go to meet Allah, then we will... Tell the Prophet Sallallahu Salaam from you and if you go before us, say the same from our behalf as well. So Sayyid bin Zayd an illustrious, illustrious companion of the Prophet Sallallahu 
one of the ten promised Jannah. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the true teachings of Sayyid bin Zayd as something that we can implement into our lives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the lessons that we have discussed with relation to Sayyid bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala and including the importance of parents, their du'as, the different things that we've spoken about today, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the tawfiq to act upon them. Inshallah, before we go upstairs, if there's any questions, we take the questions. Subhanallah, bihamdi, subhanakallah, bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiru wa natubu wa ni jazakallah khairah. If there's any questions, inshallah, we'll take the questions. Inshallah, we'll take the questions. Yes. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Um, you know you said that there's a hadith about taking land on just fine. So how, how does like the expansion of the Islamic Empire work? So uh, the, the crux in that, and I wanted to speak about this because this is something that's very prevalent in our community where people take land, especially back home, belonging to others. Um, but when it comes to an Islamic Empire, the word unjust doesn't come in. So dhulman, unjustly. So that wouldn't apply there. But I'm talking about where you have inheritance, where people are taking what's not theirs, etc. Is it limited to land? Some ulama, they say no. This is taking anything that doesn't belong to you. That's why the Prophet ﷺ, this, uh, you know, wealth, money. The Prophet ﷺ, this masala came up this week, that unfortunately there was someone who has passed away uh, committing suicide. Um, went through mental health uh, issues. So the Prophet ﷺ, would not perform janazah salah on certain individuals. The Muslims would perform janazah salah, but the Prophet wouldn't. One of the people that the Prophet wouldn't perform janazah salah upon himself was someone who had a debt that they didn't pay back. That taking someone's money that's not yours and not giving it back, the Prophet wouldn't read your janazah salah. Very, 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 very dangerous. So similarly with wealth, with land, we need to be extremely careful, extremely careful. That if something doesn't belong to you, you can't take it. Otherwise, there are heavy ramifications on the Day of Judgment. Extreme, extreme. And unfortunately, especially within the Asian community, there is this, there is this issue of people taking what doesn't belong to them with inheritance. Brothers taking all of the sisters' rights. The sisters do something, tough luck. Uh, I've had, uh, these are continuous stories that I have to go through and messiahs that I have to deal with and it's very unfortunate. We don't understand the ramifications of that. Mm. Yes? So if cut relations in the sense that if there is harm to you and if there is harm to your faith, then you can cut somebody off to a certain degree. Other than that, the salam aspect, there are certain people that they don't mean well to you and you know that if you say salam you can move on, there's nothing wrong with that. You have to protect yourself and you have to protect your faith. Iman and, and health, two things. That's what the Prophet said, whoever dies in defense of their self, for who shaheed. Yes. I'm just wondering, is it virtuous to defend yourself if you've been back with them or should you stay patient and generally stay stay quiet. Generally stay quiet. Um just let the person that's a sin on their behalf. If they don't seek your forgiveness, then they owe you on the day of judgment, right? Um with that hadith, there's an extension to that hadith, and I'll, uh, inshallah, the brothers here, we're going to go upstairs now. Um, that the Prophet ﷺ was actually asked in another riwayat, the riwayat is by Abu, Imam Abu Dawood in his sunan, that one sahabi came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Ya Rasulullah, what if somebody comes to try and take what's mine? The Prophet ﷺ says, fight him for it, defend it. So he says, Ya Rasulullah, what if I am killed in the middle of that? So the Prophet ﷺ says, Anta shaheed. And he says, Ya Rasulullah, what if that person is killed? فَهُوَ فِي النَّارِ He's in the fire of Jahannam. So defending what's yours is including your izzah and your honor. There's no harm in that. Okay, inshallah. Subhanallah bihamdi, subhanakallah bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiru wa nadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiru wa nadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiru wa nadu wa